Hello, everyone. Welcome to another live stream here at Piano Video Lessons. So just in case you don't know me, if this is your first time here, my name is Lisa, and I am the teacher here at Piano Video Lessons on YouTube and also at pianovideolessons.com. So if you're like me, you've probably been spending a lot of time at home these days. I know where I am here in Canada, we are asked to be socially distancing and self isolating so we've been spending lots of time at home. And so one of the great things you can do when you're at home by yourself is practice the piano. So I decided it would be a good idea to do a series of live streams that would keep us busy and give us some things to do while we're at home alone. <laughs> so today's topic is piano practicing and how you can be more effective in your piano practicing and things that you can do to make piano practicing a little bit more fun. And so we started off on Sunday. Our first topic was um, so reading music. So on Sunday, we did a live stream on how to read music. If you've never read it before, I gave you sort of an overview. And then on Monday, we talked about piano technique and how to play the piano with proper uh, hand posture and technique. Then on Tuesday, yesterday, we did a stream on the uh, how to learn a brand new piece, how to attack a new piece of music if you're teaching it to yourself. And today we're going to be doing uh, the topic of practicing a piece of music. So uh, this stream was supposed to happen earlier in the day. So hopefully some of you are still able to tune in. I had uh, a technical difficulty. I had to push it to later in the day. So you can see it's dark outside. And so it's evening here where I am. So I hope everybody is doing well. I have I don't see any comments in the chat yet, but I do see that there are several people tuned in. So if you would please say hello in the uh, comments here on YouTube, then I'll know that you're here. And if you have any questions, you can also post those in the chat on YouTube so that I'll know how to, to answer your questions. And also I'll be checking the comments from time to time just to see if anybody has any questions um, about what I'm teaching today. So I do see some comments have come in and there is a little bit of a lag here. So um, we won't, I won't always see them right away. But I do have a comment here from Jia Chen saying, hello, Lisa, I love your channel. Hello, nice to see you. And I have a comment from Epion System saying, hi, Lisa. Well, hello to you too. And Maria is saying hello. Hello, Maria. Nice to have you with us today. All right. So I'm going to get started talking about practicing the piano. And you can go ahead and continue to post any comments and questions that you might have. So the first thing that you need to do when you are practicing your new piece of music or practicing any piece of music is you have to chop your piece up into sections so that you're able to manage it. I always tell my students, it's like a piece of pizza. You don't, if someone said, here's a piece of pizza, you would say, thanks, I love pizza. And then you would proceed to take bites of the pizza and chew them. You wouldn't try to eat the whole slice in one big chunk. You wouldn't be able to eat it, you'd choke. Well, playing a piece of music is a lot like that. You want to make sure that you are um, only taking it in manageable bits. And so if we use our pizza analogy again, you could say you want to strategize the way that you're going to eat the pizza. So you might eat the hardest to eat part first. Maybe there's a section of your pizza that has some cheese falling off of it. So you're going to grab that bit right away and eat it before it makes a mess on your lap. And you're probably going to save the crust for last because, you know, that's easy to eat. It's not sticky. It's not messy. It's kind of just the, the, the handle, <laughs> the, the holder part for the piece of pizza. So but when you're thinking about your piece of music, after you've sort of looked at it and assessed where the, where the sections are, you probably want to decide which ones you want to tackle first. So you might want to tackle the ones that are all the same first or very similar. You might want to tackle um, the, the easiest section first because you just want to get a quick win. Or you might want to tackle the hardest section first. But the most important thing is that you understand your piece of music and you start to divide it up. So I'm just going to switch my camera around here and I'm going to show you a couple pieces of music that um, we potentially could learn to play. So yesterday when we were talking about learning a new piece, we had a look at this piece here from the uh, Nuna Basic Piano Series, book two, all in one. And it was on page 44. It was called Sky Shades. We've got a little shadow here. 
But we talked about how there are some similarities within this piece. And it's easy to divide into four sections if you just divide it into one section equals one line of music. And you might also then divide up the sections that are the same. So we have this measure the same as this one. So you could divide it into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sections, but not number these two differently. So it would go one, two, one, three, four, five, six, and seven. And then you would have a sense of the, the actual amount of things you need to learn in order to play this piece. So Sky Shades is a fairly short piece. It's only four lines long and it's a beginner-ish level piece. You might be working on something a little more challenging than that. You might be working on a Beethoven sonata. So here I have the Rondo from the Pathétique sonata, and I've been looking at this one and thinking about learning it, so I divided it into sections. I called the first part here the A section, and the B section starts near the bottom of this page, and then as I'm analyzing, I see this whole page here is the B section. And then on the next page, the A section repeats itself identically. So I don't have to practice this whole part in order to learn the piece. Then we have the C section and C has some differences. So I have C2 here and C3 because these have variation in the sections. Then I have the A section again, taking us into the third double page spread. So here we see that um, halfway through the A section, I've marked A2, and that's because it changes again. Then I have the D section, and then that leads us back into another A section, but it has a difference halfway down the page. So as you can see in this sonata, I've done some analysis of the piece, and I've taken the time to divide it into sections. And that's one of the things we talked about yesterday and when we we're talking about learning a new piece was we talked about analyzing it before you even play any of the notes. So now before we dig in and really practice it, it's important to still be doing a fair amount of analyzing on the page so that we know what is gonna happen when we go to play it. Now, I also see some more comments here, so I'm just gonna pop over and see who is here with me today. So I said hello to Maria already. I have CCM bike here again with us today and saying thanks for your devotion to teaching others to play the piano. I look forward to this every time you're giving a class. Well, I'm so happy. Um, for those of you who are new to piano video lessons, I have um, over 100, almost 200 free videos on my YouTube channel where you can learn to play piano right from the very beginning. And if you enjoy this live interaction, you might enjoy joining one of my online classes. I'm starting one next Sunday for beginners and one the Sunday after that, starting for people who want to learn chord style piano, uh, beginning uh, reading lead sheets and finding out how to play by chords. So if you enjoy this live interaction, you'll enjoy that even more because we get to talk in person. Uh, over the internet. So um, those classes are starting if you visit my website. And I also have a virtual studio where you don't have to be participating in any particular place um, during the piano video lessons curriculum. Wherever you are, I'll help you. I'll coach you through what you're learning at that point. So thank you for your comment. And that's just a little bit of information about other ways that you can maintain this um, sort of live interaction and have it even beefed up a little bit more if you join me in one of those live classes or studio. I have Dennis Petrea here. Hi, nice to see you again, Dennis. I have Haytham Baha. Hello, nice to see you again as well. And uh, I guess uh, Haytham is from Egypt. Wow, so must be very early in the morning maybe in Egypt right now. Definitely later than it is here. Um, a comment from Yong Chao Zhao, I hope I said that right, <laughs> saying your music teaching videos are helpful, thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. And I have a, a hello here from a name that I'll have a hard time pronouncing, but I'm gonna say Abdul Rahman Al Zarani. Hmm, hopefully I got that right. And uh, you're very welcome. And Abdul Rahman is asking about chord movements. So, I might get to something about chords today, but the topic of this particular live stream is practicing. Um, if you're looking for 
um, chord lessons, you can check out unit five or unit seven in my uh, pre-recorded video series. I now have a question from Yong Chao Zhao saying, learn to play guitar, but your piano lessons are helpful, um, are helping me to understand music. Good, oh, I'm so glad. And uh, Grace is saying, is it Lisa or Eliza? It's the first one with an S. Thank you for asking. All right, back to the previously planned material for today. Um, I just was talking about slicing and dicing your piece. Now, we've got it divided into sections. It's time to tackle practicing them. So I was mentioning before that you could start with the hardest section and give that a little bit of extra attention. But if the whole piece seems relatively the same, then something that's a good idea to try is to work on your piece in reverse. So rather than starting at the very beginning, why not start at the end? So this has some benefits, not only in getting started learning it, but mostly in how it will uh, evolve later when it comes to playing it through in performance. And also if you plan to memorize the piece, working in reverse sections is beneficial. The reason for this is that whatever we start learning, we tend to play the most because as we continue to practice it, we continue to practice the part we started with. And if the part we started with is at the end of the, the piece, that means we'll have the most experience playing the ending. So as we're playing the piece of music, we'll become more and more comfortable on the way through because as we progress through the piece, we're having more and more familiarity and we're playing with more confidence. So we won't get more nervous toward the end, we'll get more confident toward the end. So we'll know that we've really learned our piece when we can play the beginning with confidence, especially if we started learning it at the end. So we're working in reverse sections is my first tip on uh, some effective ways to practice a piece of music, especially something that's like eight pages long, like this uh, movement from the Beethoven Sonata. So now the next tip is to do slow and thoughtful practice. And I think many of us fall into the trap of wanting to sound as good as we expect to right from the beginning. So what ends up happening is we play too quickly and then we get confused or we're not prepared and we end up playing things incorrectly. And those early incorrect playthroughs are the ones that are the most dangerous because that's when our mind is really absorbing the music and our fingers are being trained on what to play. So if we start off by playing things too quickly in haste, then we will find that we make mistakes and those early mistakes are difficult to um, eradicate. In fact, they're so difficult to eradicate that a teacher of mine once said, if you played it wrong once at the very beginning, it takes 20 times of playing it correctly before your mind finally agrees ah, this is the way I'm supposed to play it. And it's been compared to like if you took a blank piece of paper and a pencil and you just drew a firm line on your blank paper. It only took one motion to create the line. But if you were going to erase the line with your eraser, it would not just take once to erase it. It would take rubbing over that line 15 or 20 times before it would finally be gone from the page. And if you looked very carefully, you would still see it there. So in many ways, playing through the piece in the early stage is definitely the time to make sure you're not playing with the wrong fingers on the wrong notes. And at this time, it's very important to play slowly. And it's also important to stop when you're unsure. So I'm just going to demonstrate a little bit of that. So I'm gonna play thoughtfully and slowly. I'm just gonna switch my camera over here so you can see what I'm playing. I'm gonna play this Beethoven and I'm gonna start at the end just as I've suggested that you do. And you can see here, I've made a few little um, triangles. <laughs> I guess they sort of look like pieces of pizza, but I've made a little triangle here and you can see that this is just the ending. And then I made another triangle here because this is a bigger section at the end. And then I've made another triangle here, and this section leads up to that. And I've made another one here. And so each of these, if you look at them, you'll see that they have different styles of rhythm 
than each other. And so these sections have been divided up according to their characteristics. So I'm just gonna sit that down with my squeaky bench. I've had this bench for a very long time and it's served me well, but I'm starting to wonder if I should replace it because it's very squeaky. So now I'm gonna look just at the end of this piece and I'm gonna play thoughtfully and slowly as I go. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak out loud about what I'm thinking as I play this. So first of all, I'm deciding what finger to use and I'm gonna decide on playing it with my third finger. I notice it starts on an E flat. And so I'm gonna play so slowly that I can think through all of this. So I'm gonna play three, triple it, then F, triple it, left hand's playing a G chord, triple it, and I missed a flat because I'm trying to teach on the internet, triple it, triple it, triple it, triple it, triple it, and then C minor. So my left, I'm thinking about G major and then C minor. Now I'll try that again, slowly and thoughtfully, triple it, triple it. So I had all the right notes and all the right fingers. I'm going to do it again. So I have this problem. You might have this as well these days. I've been using a lot of hand sanitizer and my fingers are super dry. So I've been falling off the black keys just a little bit. So I'm gonna do it even slower so that I don't fall off. So now I'm comfortable on the notes. I'm gonna assess what else I might need to do. So I need to make sure I play fortissimo because there's some dynamic marking. And I have three beats of rest in the second measure, so I'm going to be careful on that. I'll do it again. I'll do it again. All right, so I played slowly and thoughtfully, and I worked on that section until I felt like I had gotten it under my fingers a little bit. Now, because I'm working this piece in reverse sections, I'm gonna be playing that section more times. So maybe I've played it enough times. But now I'm just gonna talk a little bit about repetitions. And first I'm gonna check the comments and see what's going on here. Um, I'm gonna see um, greetings from Peru, uh, from Noob Proof. Nice to see you. Thanks for joining me. That looks like a, 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 a dice for playing um, Dungeons and Dragons. And then I see a comment from Epion System saying that's a pretty interesting way to look at it. And I'm assuming you're either talking about the pizza or you're talking about the reverse sections. And then I have Donna Halstra saying that she's not, she's glad she's not the only one with a squeaky bench. You are definitely not alone having a squeaky bench. All right, so talking about repetitions now, um, the thing about repetition is it can be really boring. So it's helpful if you have some sort of um, method or distraction or game to help you along with that. So there's a few different games that you can use or a few different practice strategies that you can try. Um, one of them is called emoji practice. And I'm just gonna try to pull up a, um, I'm gonna try to pull up a, uh, an image for that in just a moment, um, but I need to upload something. So I'm gonna try and talk while I do that. I don't talk and do other things very well at the same time, but I am gonna try. Um, so emoji practice is a good one to use. And then some other things that you could do, uh, you might use some practice aids, some, some practice tools. So one of them would be just to find three things that you can easily maneuver around as counters. Another thing that you could use is a pack of playing cards. And something else you could use is some dice. So these are just some things you'd have around the house that might make it easy for you to practice and to keep track of your repetitions and to make you stay engaged with um, analyzing how well you uh, performed that playthrough on your section. So let's just talk about 
emoji practice. So emoji practice is a way to determine how comfortable you are when playing something. So here we have an image of emoji practice. And it's, I use this with my students. And if you make a mistake, you're on the bottom emoji. Oh no, I made a mistake. If you played it and you were concerned that you might make a mistake, you're on the second emoji from the bottom, which is, I was a little worried. Now, maybe you did it pretty well and you didn't feel worried. So now you're on the middle emoji, that little smiley face guy that says, maybe I've got it. And then if you played it, but you weren't worried at all and it felt good, then you're on this next one that's like, oh, happy smile. It feels good. And then if you've played it and you know that you really couldn't even make a mistake if you tried, hold on my hand, if you're on this one up here, <laughs> then you would feel like you, you really anchored it and learned it. So if you make a mistake, you're on, oh no, I made a mistake use two hands. If you um, played it without mistakes, but you felt a little concerned, then you're on this one like, oh no, I was a little worried. If you weren't worried, but it was like the first time you weren't worried, then you're on maybe I've got it. And then here it feels good. That's like, oh, I've been starting to play it without worries and it's starting to feel good. And it's like up here, we're like, oh, I, I don't even think I could play it wrong. I've really got it. So I like to use this little emoji practice as one of the um, one of the, the guides for deciding how you feel. And it's sort of a barometer to let you know how much more practicing you need to do. You probably want to practice it until you get all the way to the very top. So that's what I call emoji practice. And when I was just playing through that last section of the Beethoven Sonata, that last final uh, measure, two measures, um, I was sort of using emoji practice as I played it. So I was thinking, oh, I'm a little worried. I'm a little worried. Oh, it feels good. Oh, I really have it. Oh, now I've really got it. So it, it gave me a sense of if I was done practicing. Now, another thing you could do is you could do a three in a row practice uh, game. So I'm just going to flip my camera around again and I'm gonna try, here we go. And I'm gonna do the same section that I just did. And I'm gonna use these three um, right on wipe off markers to help me keep track of whether or not I did these right three in a row. So I'm gonna play through it and I'm gonna decide if it was right or not. So here I go. Okay, it was right. So I'm gonna move one of these over and now I'm gonna try it again. So I don't know if it was right because I kind of heard an extra note in the middle there. So now I'm gonna bring this guy back over here because I, I wasn't right. That was right, so this one goes over again. I'll try it again. Definitely was right. So now there's a little more pressure on me because if I make a mistake, these two have to go back over here. So now I'm gonna do it again. All right, so now the third one joins the other two. And now in order to win the game, I have to do it one more time. And this one, there's a lot of pressure because if I make a mistake, they have to all go back to the starting side. So here I go. All right, so I got it and I'm finished practicing this section. So that is one way that you can practice um, with some sort of little game to tell you how well you've done. Now, I would probably not do that until I have completed the emoji practice and managed to feel like I really have it. Now, another game that you could play besides three in a row is Beat the Dealer. So this one I got from a website and I'll link it in the video later. I can't remember exactly what it's called, but I feel like it's called colorful keys or something like this. Basically, you get a deck of cards and you pretend that there's a dealer. Sorry for the loud noises. You pretend that there's a dealer and you shuffle the deck and you get three cards. And the dealer gets the points that are in the cards that you, that you deal this first time through. So here we go, the dealer is gonna have 10 plus three plus, uh, we're gonna call aces one just for ease. So there's 14 points for the dealer. Sometimes the dealer can have 30 if you end up with face cards. Face cards are worth 10. And now I'm gonna play this section. And if I get it right, I'm gonna give myself a card. 
And I'm going to keep on playing it until I have more points on my side than the dealer has on their side. Now, the catch is, if I make a mistake, I have to give the card to the dealer. But I don't know how many points the card is worth until after I play the section. So I'm just going to put the cards there, face down, and I'm going to play this. Now, there's also no speed requirement. You can go slower if you need to. <laughs> Oh, I made a little mistake. I was going quite quickly and my left pinky hit the wrong low note. So this card now goes to the dealer. The dealer has four more points. So now the dealer has 18 points. And I'm gonna try again. And I might decide to just go a little slower so I don't make a mistake. And I got it. Now this card will be for me because I was right. Oh, it's a joker. Remove the jokers from your deck before you start. This card will be for me. So I got 10 points. So I'm going to put that one on my side. Now, you can also cancel out the points um, from the dealer and just get those cards out of the way so that you don't have too much math to do. That's what I like to do. So now I have eight points on the dealer side, and I still have zero. I'm going to play it again. And this one's for me because I got it right. Whoo, 10 points. Okay, so I beat the dealer. The dealer had eight. I now have 10. That was a pretty short game of beat the dealer. But it's a fun game to play as you're um, as you're getting more and more familiar with playing a piece of music. So then, another game you can play is to use some dice, and it's a similar game to beat the dealer. But all it does is you start off with a die and you roll it, and you see how many points it is. It's five. And the idea is to keep a tally. I'm just going to grab a little piece of paper here. Is to keep a tally of these points. And whenever you get to 30, you win. So I'm gonna make a check mark on one side of my paper and an X on the other side. And I'm playing for five points and I'm playing until 30. So here I go. Ah, so I wanted to go up instead of down there. And so I mark the five points, one, two, three, four, five on the X side. Now I have to try to, uh, to get to the check mark before I get an, uh, 30 points on the X side. All right, so I didn't roll the dice. So I was supposed to roll the dice before I played. So that one was worth three, and I'm slipping all over the keys again, so I do have to slow down. My dry hands are falling off the black keys. So here I'm playing for only one point, okay. I did it right, but I only got one point. Now I roll again. And this time it's worth five again. Whoops, I'm sorry. I'm thinking. Here I go. Just first always check. And I got five points. So one, two, three, four, five. And you get the idea. You continue practicing until you get to 30 points correct. And um, if you end up getting the 30 points wrong before you got to 30 points correct, you were playing too fast or your section was too big or... Uh, you need to figure out what's going on in the music and think about it before you play. Because practicing enough to lose the game is sort of anti-practicing. Uh, it's like reverse practicing, practicing mistakes. So I like to say practice doesn't make perfect, but perfect practice does make perfect. Practice makes permanent. So if you're playing things incorrectly, then you're gonna permanently learn them incorrectly. So that is sort of a fact that's undeniable. All right, so those are the games I wanted to show you about practicing the piano today. If you have any more comments or questions, you can go ahead and post them up now. But I think it's important um, when you're practicing the piano to do it mindfully because if you just give yourself a whole series of really bad concerts, then you're not gonna get better at playing piano. And if you're taking the time to analyze your music and really examine what's going on and plan before you play, then you're gonna see yourself making progress and you're gonna make the best use of your time. We're all busy people and if we're um, practicing carelessly, then we're gonna make more work for ourselves. But if we're practicing carefully, then we're gonna make more progress in a shorter amount of time. So that's super important. 
All right, um, I'm just gonna leave a minute or two here for any comments or questions at the end of today's live stream. And I'll just take a minute to remind you that all of the videos here on YouTube are free and I have a whole series of lessons that will take you from very beginner who doesn't know how to play piano at all and doesn't know how to read music yet, all the way up to the uh, pieces from the grade one level of uh, the Royal Conservatory. So if you wanna check out those videos, just pop down into my playlists here on YouTube and you can get started learning today. And also I have a website, pianovideolessons.com, where you can find all the videos sort of organized instead of just on YouTube in playlists and also the PDFs for those uh, free video lessons are available on the website for purchase. And if you're looking for uh, actual coaching in real time from me, then you can either join one of my upcoming online classes. I've got a beginner class starting on Sunday the 22nd and also on Sunday the 29th, I'm starting a courting boot camp. Um, those are both really great classes to start and give a try. And also I have a virtual piano studio where you can get coached on um, whatever point of piano learning you happen to be at. So you can check those out at pianovideolessons.com if you're looking for more information about those. And all the free, all the free videos are right here on YouTube. All right, going to have a quick look at the questions. Um, I have West Star saying hi from Spain at half past midnight. I'm saying hello back to you in Spain. I'm here in Canada. I had some plans to come to Spain at the end of June. I'm hoping that I'll still be able to get there, but it might have to be delayed. Things the way travel is right now is uh, it makes a big question. So I also have a comment from Maria Gordon saying, I'm totally lost. I'm a beginner. Thanks for being so considerate. Well, if you're lost, Maria, I suggest you go back to video number one and work your way through those. And then I have a comment from Epion Systems saying, this was perfect. I was going to learn a song today and I'm going to use these ideas. Awesome. Well, I'm super glad that I gave you some fun ideas for practicing. And uh, I'll just going to refresh from the beginning what I mentioned, which was um, look over the whole piece to figure out where the sections are, chop the piece up so that you have it in um, smaller bits to manage, and then choose your attack. Do you want to start with the hardest pieces? Do you want to start with the end? Or do you want to get a couple of easy wins and start with the easier sections? And then it's time to start practicing. So you can use emoji practice to see if you're ready to do any real serious drilling. And then you can also use some of those practice uh, games that I showed you, which was the three in a row game where all you need is three something, three erasers or three markers. And we also did beat the dealer where you use some cards to see how long you have to keep on practicing. And we also played the dice game where you roll a dice and try to get 30 points. Um, then I just see a couple more comments popping through here before I say goodbye. I have a comment from Jia Chen saying, thank you, Lisa. The practice tips are very helpful. My daughter is going to draw an emoji pose it now. Excellent. And so that's part of the fun, right? Is you get to uh, enjoy mm, being creative as you practice at the same time. So that's it for today's live stream. I have another one scheduled for tomorrow. It's earlier in the day. It's scheduled to be uh, like seven hours earlier than today's stream was. And tomorrow it's talking about memorizing a piece of music. So once you, you know, learned the notes and chopped it up and, and got started and practiced it, then you might want to memorize. So I'll give you some tips on effective ways to memorize music. And thanks so much for joining me and I will see you guys tomorrow. Bye-bye.